Good evening and welcome. I'm Paulette Patterson Dilworth, Vice President for Diversity, Equity and Inclusion here at the University of Alabama at Birmingham. And on behalf of the Office of Diversity, Equity and Inclusion, I'd like to welcome you to an evening with Professor Carol Anderson. I promise you, you're in for a treat. Um, as you can see on the um, slide here, um, we've shown several of the works that we plan to have a discussion with her about tonight. So we invite you to sit back, relax, and uh, feel free to enter questions in the Q&A as things come to your mind. I'd also like to uh, thank our sponsors for this evening, which include um, the Office of um, Multicultural Programs and Services for Students, University of Alabama at Tuscaloosa, the University of Alabama at Huntsville, and the Institute for Human Rights. Also, um, I'd like to um, remind you that we have future events scheduled for November. Our upcoming events include implicit and explicit bias in science and medicine, and our featured um, Speaker for that event will be Dr. Mona Fiad, who is um, professor in, in our School of Medicine and Executive Director of the um, Minority Health Disparities Center. Um, we have the Social Justice Movie Club that is an ongoing event. Um, you can register for this club and join the club by uh, using the QR club that's actually on the website. I don't think this one is active, that's on the slide. And then the Final um, entry for November is the underrepresentation of women in leadership. And the speaker for that event will be Dr. Cynthia Warwick, who is the current president of Stillman College in Tuscaloosa. I want to um, begin by giving um, you some introductory remarks about our speaker. I think that you will come to appreciate and, and learn who she is once we get into our discussion here. But Professor Anderson is the Charles Howard Candler Professor and Chair of African American Studies at Emory University. She is nationally recognized as a historian, educator, and author. Her research focuses on public policy, particularly the ways that domestic and international policies intersect through the issues of race, justice, and equality in the US. Some of her most popular work at the moment includes One Person, No Vote, how voter suppression is destroying our democracy and has, was long listed for the National Book Award and a finalist for the Penn Galbraith Award for nonfiction. She's also the author of White Rage, The Unspoken Truth of a Racial Divide, which was a Washington Post notable book for 2016 and the National Book Critics Circle Award winner. Her most recent work, The Second, focuses on illuminating the history and impact of the Second Amendment and how it was designed and how it has consistently been constructed to keep African-Americans powerless and vulnerable. The second is neither a pro-gun nor an anti-gun book. The lens is the citizenship rights and human rights for African-Americans. From, from the 18th century, when it was encoded into law that the enslaved could not own, carry, or use a firearm whatsoever until today with measures to expand and curtail gun ownership aimed disproportionately at the African-American population. The right to bear arms has been consistently used as a weapon to keep African-Americans powerless, revealing that armed or unarmed blackness, uh, unarmed blackness, it would seem, is the threat that must be neutralized and punished. Welcome, Dr. Professor Anderson. Uh, thank you so much for having me. Sure, we're so excited to have you. I want to uh, begin by sharing with you an email that I got from one of your followers here at UAB because I think it sort of helps to set this tone for one of the reasons why we were so insistent on having you uh, join us um, this semester. And the author of the letter writes, my, my, I am so excited to see Dr. Anderson is going to speak on October 19th. I only wish it had been in person. My goal is to meet her face to face someday. White rage definitely gave me deep insight and has changed my perspective on some things as well as how I navigate life now. And she had one request, which she would have loved to met you in person, but if that's not possible, eventually she wants you to autograph her book. Uh, so I thought I would put that there, but I think it does help to frame how people have come to appreciate and understand 
your work. And um, I want to open our a discussion by posing a question because it sort of also, when you do a Google search on Carol Anderson, um, what comes up right away is the term white rage. And as I thought about your book and what it means, the op-ed that you wrote about the Ferguson protest, um, you said that Ferguson isn't about black rage against cops, but white rage against black progress. What is white rage? White rage is a series of policies that come into being whenever African-Americans make significant progress toward their citizenship rights. And we see it, you know, so we often think of rage as being this violent thing. But what I'm talking about is the kind of bureaucratic violence, the kind of, of, of policies that cloak themselves in legitimacy, that systematically undermine Black Americans access to their voting rights, to their equal rights, to their citizenship rights. And we see this in these key moments, like coming out of the Civil War, uh, we, we get the Black Codes, and then we get a series of Supreme Court decisions that undermine the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments, and that lead us into Jim Crow. We mm -hmm. see this in, in the Great Migration, where you have laws banning African Americans from leaving like Jacksonville, Florida to get a better job. And I imagine the, the, the <laughs> humanity of that, that you sure. cannot leave to get a better job. Um, you cannot leave this city. And so I, this is what I follow through the Brown decision mm -hmm. um, where you get massive resistance, where you get entire school districts closing down where you get the state passing laws to provide state uh, funded tuition for white children to go to all white private schools while there is nothing for black children. That's white rage, the policies that are put in place to undermine African-American advancement. Right. And as an example, I want to um, sort of go back to the beginning of the book. I think the, the um, there's a section, the first section you titled it kindling. Can you talk a little bit about kindling as a metaphor and why you chose to use that part to sort of introduce the construct? Absolutely. Um, part of it was really um, drawn by what I saw happening at Ferguson. When I saw the media just descend on Ferguson going, Ooh, look at them burning up the quick trip. Look, look at that black rage. And so they were so focused in on the fire, so focused in on the flames that they missed the kindling. They missed all of the policies that had been put in place and put down on that black community that led to that fire. When all we're paying attention to is the fire, we never see the policies that created that flame. And I wanted that, those flames are the kindling. Right. I mean, so um, I also noticed that when you started the discussion in White Rage, you started with the Reconstruction era, but you didn't talk about Lincoln. You talked about his uh, successor, Andrew Johnson. Can you help us understand why you picked Johnson to focus on in terms of introducing this whole uh, discussion about White Rage? Yeah, so Lincoln's Lincoln, um, and Lincoln had his issues, but Johnson was the one who really began to, to the implementation policy after the Civil War. Mm -hmm. And what Johnson came up with, Johnson's whole thing was, it was about reuniting the nation. This wasn't about slavery. This wasn't about Black people. Um, this wasn't about, oh, we've got some new citizens here. This was about reuniting the nation. And, his, and he was so anti-Black that his policies really, really drove that home from um, being fine with the Black codes, um, from providing amnesty to Confederate leaders who then reassumed their position back in the government mm -hmm. and then were passing laws and new constitutions, like the one in Louisiana that said, this is and has ever, will forever be a government made for white men. And those of African descent can never be citizens. I mean, so when that is the constitution 
after the Civil War and Johnson is fine with it. Mm -hmm. And the violence that was raining down on black folks and his policies that, that sanctioned that violence. Mm -hmm. um, that all of that, his, his, his framing of, of what this war was about and his framing of who black people are made the, 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 made that incredible war like it didn't even happen. Right, right. Yeah. So that, that to me sounds very familiar in the 21st century in, in many ways, uh, the, the framing of black people, the ways in which uh, black life has been used as political pawns in a variety of elections all over the country. Um, why is it that this message um, seems to be lost on a lot of people, you think, that they don't, they're not as like, the young people like to say, we need to stay woke. Um, but it seems to me that people are sleeping on this history and the parallels that we are now living in. And that's why I write these books. <laughs> um, I, that's why I am a historian, um, because I really believe if we understand what happened then, we understand how we got here. Um, when you have these myth histories, um, then these things don't make sense. And it just, it looks like it just springs up out of nowhere. Mm -hmm. When in fact there is Mark Twain apocryphally said, history may not repeat itself, but it show do rhyme. <laughs> so, so listening to those rhymes, paying attention to those rhymes, we begin to see these patterns emerging. And those patterns tell us so much about American society. It tells us about who we value and who we don't. It mm -hmm. tells us about the way that we frame arguments so that the unpalatable becomes acceptable. Mm -hmm. It tells us about how power is wielded and how it is systematically denied and yanked from people despite how hard they have fought. And mm. it tells us about the way that we craft these narratives, these narratives that create heroes and villains and these narratives that are really flattened and two dimensional. So we don't understand what it takes to really struggle and what mm. we don't understand what it takes to really fight for our humanity. Yeah, that's, I mean, and, and it's consistent. You mentioned in, um, your response to the white rage um, idea of what white rage is about the way in which people were referring to black rage, um, which ultimately sort of speaks to the way in which blacks respond to oppression and things of that nature. So this question basically, um, I'm wanting to sort of dig deeper into understanding when we think about protest and how that has sort of evolved over time. There's been this large focus on looting and rioting when black people take to the streets, right? Rather than the conditions which led to ongoing protests against the bureaucratic violence in their communities. What are some of the examples that you've seen of this where the, the, the focus has been on what is characterized as black looting as opposed to the problems that led to black people taking to the streets? It's virtually in every instance. Um, so it was in uh, Watts in 64, it was uh, Watts in 65, you saw it in Cleveland and Detroit in 67, you saw it in Newark in 67, um, you, you saw it in um, LA, um, you saw it in, in Minneapolis, um, you saw it, I mean, it becomes, again, part of this narrative script that when Black folks are protesting that this is violent, this is looting. So, mm -hmm. and again, the, the, the data, for instance, that came out on the Black Lives Matter protests showed that over 90% of those protests were peaceful. Mm -hmm. But what you get is this narrative of how violent they were. And so mm -hmm. you get this false equivalency happening, saying that the violence that we saw, for instance, um, on January 6th, that insurrection at the Capitol, mm -hmm. that that needed to be balanced with the violence of the Black Lives Matter protest, mm -hmm. except that was violent at the Capitol. Right. Black Lives Matter, no. No, <laughs> um, not at all. And, and we also know that that protest that happened in Minneapolis, um, that 
the shooting at the police station that happened there, that Black Lives Matter, that was a white nationalist who was trying to create the aura of Black people being violent and shooting at the cops. Mm -hmm. I mean, so this is also part of what, we, what doesn't get factored into because America needs the narrative of Black pathology in order to justify the kinds of policies that happen. And so this is also what I'm bringing out in White Rage. The, the, they need the narrative of, of Black thugs mm -hmm. um, to justify the war on drugs. Although the studies are clear that African-Americans use drugs the least of any racial or ethnic group in the United States, except for marijuana when it's equal. Mm -hmm. um, that you need the narrative of Black folks just don't care about education. You know, mm -hmm. Black people don't care about school. Their, their mm -hmm. parents don't care about school. Their kids don't care about school. To justify the, the under, under um, resourcing of Black schools. Right. Um, so, so these narratives of Black pathology are used then to justify the kind of white rage policies that right. consistently undermine um, Black achievement. Well, there is um, sort of a parallel there as well. Um, you and I just talked about it minutes ago, the idea that there are jobs that, uh, or um, companies are having a challenge of, of hiring people. And what you hear people in response to that say is, people just don't want to work. Uh, and especially the unspoken is that Black people don't want jobs anymore, that they don't want to work. They'd rather sit and wait for government handouts. And what I think has been missing from that is the there is an underlying reason as to why people are not jumping at these jobs. Well, you know, and, and that narrative of Black folks just don't want to work was one of the narratives used to justify slavery, that Absolutely. you had to have the whip in order to force black people to work. And it wasn't that folk, black folks needed to be whipped to work. It was that they needed to be paid. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, you know, just something real basic here. Yeah. <laughs> um, and, 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 and Andrew Johnson, whom we spoke about earlier, he was absolutely opposed to the Civil Rights Act of 1866 because mm -hmm. he's like, this is just gonna be a government handout and the Freedmen's Bureau, mm -hmm. um, that bill as well, because this is a government handout. They'll never learn how to work. They'll always be dependent upon the government mm -hmm. for a handout. They just don't wanna work. So this narrative has been embedded into the American psyche. So this, they don't wanna work is what we often hear when it comes to issues of welfare, for instance. Mm -hmm. um, and again, we don't take into account the societal policies that, that have created that structure. And it's mm -hmm. not don't want to work, it is pay me. And I right. think one of the things that COVID-19 really did was folks were like, I am not going out there mm -hmm. unless I can be adequately protected and mm -hmm. adequately paid. Absolutely. That, that, Absolutely. That's, I put that in the land of folks, this ain't hard. <laughs> right, absolutely. And in fact, there was a, I can't remember one of the news um, stations that I was watching and they were interviewing people who were essentially, they were asking, would you take a job for $10? And some of the people were like, absolutely not. Why should I go work for $10 when they have reaped the benefit of um, government handouts just like everyone else. And now they want to reopen their doors and offer people $10 an hour. And in fact, the working conditions haven't really improved a whole lot either. I mean, that was one of the uh, arguments that a lot of the people they were talking to made about this whole idea. And the, the idea that people of people going to work, what they're suggesting is they want something to change if that yes. happens. You know, so, so, so much of what people are asking for is so much of what my books are about is about how do we get to a much more humane place, mm -hmm. a much more humane society mm -hmm. where people can actually live into their greatness, live into their humanity, where they're not consistently assaulted um, and having and being devalued and debased mm -hmm. um, and having these policies demean them in such ways that it is designed to destroy instead of empower. Right, absolutely. And that's a good segue into my next question, uh, Professor Anderson. Um, last year, you authored an opinion in The Guardian in response to everything happening around the death of George Floyd. 
And the title of the article was, in, in 1919, the state failed to protect Black Americans. A century later, it is still failing. What was happening in 1919 that drew such a parallel to 2020? Ooh. <laughs> 1919 was Red Summer. Uh -huh. And Red Summer is when you had African Americans attacked because they dared to believe in democracy. You had Black soldiers coming back from the war to make the world safe for democracy. And the response was, oh no, you are not safe in this democracy. This is a white man's democracy. And so for you to think you're equal, we're gonna put you back in your place. And you saw just massive state violence raining down on black folk. Uh, one of the ones that really was salient for me mm -hmm. was Elaine, Arkansas. Mm. In Elaine, Arkansas, you had black sharecroppers who had basically worked from can't to can't, from when you can't see the sun until you can't yeah. see the sun again. And they were paid nothing for that labor, that yearly labor, nothing. And so they began to organize, to form a labor union, join a labor union. And they knew that forming a labor union, one of them said, the white folks find out about this, they will kill us. Mm -hmm. And so they had centuries at the church where they were organizing. And a, a group of, of, of scouts from the landowners came up to break up the meeting. There was gunfire exchanged mm -hmm. and a white man was killed and another white man was wounded. Word got back to the town that black folks are out to kill all of the whites in Phillips County. Mm. And mm. the lynch mobs descended on that black community. Black folks fought back. And so two more white men were killed. Then the governor calls in the US Army and the army comes in with machine guns used in France in the war and begins machine gunning down black people. Up to 800 or so were killed in this slaughter in Elaine, Arkansas. This mm. is state sponsored slaughter because black people had the audacity to believe they should be paid for their labor. Yeah. So that story, I mean, that's one of those narratives of, a, of African American history, like um, Oklahoma, the Black Wall Street, mm -hmm. um, um, the town in Florida where they killed the whole community of Black people. Okoy, yeah. Yeah, they're, they are consistently associated with what I would characterize as power conceding nothing to Ooh. nothing. And ultimately, the idea is that we can annihilate you before we give up our power to yeah. you. I mean, this is what you saw in Wilmington, North Carolina in 1898. Mm -hmm. This is in Ocoee, Florida in 1920, where Black people had the audacity to try to vote. And this mm -hmm. is after the passage of the 19th Amendment, where they were trying to get Black women registered to vote. Mm -hmm. And the thing was, what makes you think you can vote after mm -hmm. this war to make the world safe for democracy? Mm -hmm. We will kill you. Mm -hmm. And what they had was an ethnic cleansing of Akoi, Florida, where they killed or ran out every Black person there so that there was not a Black person on the census for the next five or six decades mm -hmm. in Akoi, Florida. Mm -hmm. uh, this is the kind of state-sponsored, state-sanctioned violence that happens to Black people who dare to believe that they have the right to be American citizens and are wielding the rights of American citizens. And so when I, when I made that comparison, it was looking at the way that the state was raining down violence on Black people um, and, and, and without accountability. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and, and, and leaving Black folks. So when they said Black Lives Matter, this is what we were talking about. Right, this absolutely. We talking about, yes. Absolutely. Minoritized communities gain the right to vote and then they are met with voter suppression, which you've alluded to, voter suppression tactics and laws. In 2008 and 12, Black people came out to vote in record numbers, clearly. The next election, not so much, and we've had the rise, and then we had the rise of Donald Trump. Four years later, Black people and other racially minoritized communities returned to the polls in record numbers to elect Biden. Unlike prior elections, there is this 
outraged an accusation of stolen votes, voting fraud led by um, former president. Is voter fraud a real thing? Benjamin Ginsburg, who was an attorney for the Republicans for four decades and who was mounting their challenges to a series of laws, did an op-ed in the Washington Post mm -hmm. in, 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 19, in, in 2020, where he said, voter fraud is the Republicans Loch Ness monster. Mm. You know, it's the thing that we say is there, we keep hunting for it, keep looking for it, and we can't find it. Justin Levitt, who is a, a law professor out of California, did a study. He found from 2000 to 2014, out of 1 billion votes cast in the United States, there were 31 cases of voter impersonation fraud, 31 over 15 years out of 1 billion votes. And so again, what we have is this narrative of massive rampant voter fraud. And listen where that narrative identifies the source of that fraud. It's coming out of St. Louis. That's what they said in 2000. It's mm -hmm. coming out of Philadelphia. It's mm -hmm. coming out of Atlanta. It's coming out of Detroit. It's coming out of Milwaukee. So it is tying this, this language of massive rampant voter fraud to cities that have sizable minority populations, therefore linking criminality, the theft of American democracy mm. by these leeches who are in these cities, by these minorities, by these black people who are stealing our hard earned democracy. That's what we're seeing here. Mm. And so it's the language that we saw that justified voter ID laws it's the language that we see, we're seeing now that's justifying all of these voter suppression laws that are coming across the nation after the 2020 election because black folks turned out to vote. And so what this is saying is how dare you exercise your rights as American citizens? How dare you act like you're American citizens with the right to vote? We are going to erect these obstacles, these barriers to make it even harder to put you back in your place. It's the same language that we got in 1890 with the Mississippi plan because Mississippi saw that they had more African-Americans registered to vote than they had whites. Mm -hmm. And they went, oh, it was a, like a Scooby-Doo moment. Oh, Shaggy. I mean, there's something that's going to go real wrong here. Yeah. Um, and uh, afraid of what that Black electoral power meant. And so they set up in, a, in their constitution to get around the 15th Amendment that says, the state shall not abridge the right to vote on account of race, color, or previous condition of servitude. So they wrote the guidelines for voting access to the ballot mm -hmm. box that didn't mention we don't want black folks to vote. But what they did was they used the, the, the legacies of slavery as the access to the ballot box and made those legacies the, the, the iron door that would shut down access to black voters. Wow, that's really powerful. And it actually continues to, to um, illustrate the extent to which the powerful will go to great lengths to hold on to power, inclu including annihilating a whole population of people, a community of people. Yeah. Um, so, you know, one of the one of the conversations, or many of the conversations that are happening, sort of day to day with with people, both you know, in in public spaces, and especially among, I would argue, African-Americans to the extent that this is something that they pay attention to. And even conversations that I've had with friends, there seems to be um, a level of um, exhaustion associated, <laughs> associated with just, you know, the things that are happening from day to day. How do you combat it? What, what should be our response? You know, what should we be doing, um, if anything, to overcome, come back, fight back, push back? You know, what should we be doing uh, as a community to make sure that we don't lose the ground that we have? Right. And that means that as tired as we are, we mm -hmm. can't be too tired right. um, because, <laughs> and that's T-Y-A-D. Right. Um, tired. I was tired, boss. Tired. Um, because 
this battle is ongoing. Mm -hmm. And and if we cede, C-E-D-E, our power, then that means that that ground will be seized. Uh, It means that we mobilize. It means that we organize. It means that we talk with each other and among each other Mm -hmm. about what the real issues are, that we don't get seduced by the language, that, that the narratives that keep flowing out there that make us think that this is hopeless. The part of the way, for instance, voter suppression works Mm -hmm. is to make you think that the system is so rigged that there is nothing you can do about it. Mm -hmm. So why bother? That's Mm -hmm. a key element in voter suppression. That's why that 2020 turnout, it was like, dang, they stood in line for 11 hours? Dang. (laughs) I'm like, yeah. (laughs) Um, and, and, And so it means that we continue to mobilize because if... It's, it's a takeoff on old Bobby Womack song. If you think you're lonely now. Yes, wait right. till tonight. <laughs> wait till tonight. If you think you're tired now, mm-hmm. wait until all of the access to, to resources and power that you have have been stripped away. Because that's the goal when you lay this thing out, when you see what's happening in the voting laws, mm-hmm. when you see what is happening in our school boards, um, when you in, in the state legislature banning divisive topics like the teaching of slavery and Jim Crow, as if slavery and Jim Crow aren't facts in American mm-hmm. history. Um, so if you think you're tired now, whoo, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. So, so that brings up an interesting point. I participated this summer in the Critical Race Theory Academy uh, um, with um, Dr. Crenshaw and others. And I found that to be very eye-opening to the extent that um, it does help to understand why the work that you've done, the stories that you've sort of uncovered that have yet to, a lot of people still don't know th- these histories. Um, what is it that makes our white um, friends, folk, families afraid to make sure that the, those truths are told. And I think that a lot of it has to do with the, again, these narratives that we tell ourselves, mm-hmm. the narratives that we tell ourselves about this nation, the narratives that we tell ourselves about our families and what, 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 interrogating those narratives mean for our own identities, for the, the, our, the, the way that we see ourselves in this society. So what do I mean by that? Mm-hmm. If we tell ourselves, you know, my grandfather came here with nothing and he pulled himself up by his bootstraps. He worked hard. He was a God-fearing, honest, hardworking man, loved his family, went to work every day, saved and built, the Amer- and, and built this up so we could live the American dream. Now, when that becomes your family narrative, then having to interrogate that in terms of, well, what did it mean when there was a GI Bill that black veterans could not access, Mm. but your grandfather could in -hmm. order to go to college and move from being um, in in the factory to being an engineer with a degree from Stanford. What Mm. did that mean in terms of changing his life? What did it mean when you had the FHA loans that redlined black folks out of accessing these low, low interest, really accessible loans, except for black people? What does that when you had with, I think, I forget the figure, but it was less than 5% of mm-hmm. black folks were able to get these loans um, after being more than 30 years in, um, in operation. Mm-hmm. So what does that mean in terms of the wealth creation that that, mean, that that happens when you're able to buy these homes that then bring up this equity, that you're able to tap into that equity that can then provide the cushion that your family needs to be able to go to college, to be able to buy their first home? What mm-hmm. does that mean? So when you begin to interrogate that narrative and you see the role of the state and its racist policies, in terms of creating this disparate impact, in terms of access to resources. All of a sudden, grandpa did not pull himself up by his bootstraps. And so I think that part of that is what that means for our own personal narratives. I think the other thing is that Americans do this thing of really swaddling themselves in the flag Mm -hmm. and, and 
and this, this notion of the founding fathers as being this hallowed group um, that, that were visionary and that were fearless and took on the British and wow, founded the greatest nation ever. Um, and, and they built this democracy. Now, when you have that narrative to then ask, what does it mean when you have slaveholders who are writing, we hold these truths to be self-evident? How do they deal with that paradox? How do they deal with the paradox of a constitution that has the three-fifths clause in it, mm -hmm. that has the 20-year extension of the Atlantic slave trade, mm -hmm. that has the fugitive slave clause in it? How do you deal with that in a freedom document? And, and when you begin to ask those questions, then all of a sudden that, that narrative requires a depth of interrogation and a kind of cognitive dissonance, jarring, like, whoo, whoo, <laughs> um, yeah. that, that, that becomes unsettling. But I, I look at it like therapy. You mm -hmm. gotta tell the truth if you wanna get well. Absolutely. And saying that, how, how do you begin conversations with your white people that you consider to be white allies or accomplices or people who want to be a part of disrupting those narratives? Um, how do you start those conversations with, with those people that um, are interested in, in working through these issues? I started with the history. Uh, maybe it's because I'm a historian, uh, yeah. but I started with the history because it's in that history that we understand why we're looking at the massive wealth disparity in the United States, why we're looking at massive disparities in terms of healthcare outcomes, infant mortality rates, maternal mortality rates, um, educational attainment, income, looking at that, seeing how that history works, telling those stories begins to, 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 to be this, this entree into to asking the real deep, hard questions and then being willing to do the work and not getting seduced by those flattened narratives that become the, 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 the cliches, the, 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 the hooks that reel folks in where they're like, okay, yeah. <laughs> um, so that's how I do it with the histories. Yeah, I um, watched a video, one of the YouTube videos where you were interviewed by um, one, 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 I mean, there are quite a few out there and I can't remember exactly, but the thing that struck me was uh, one of the comments that was underneath the, the way, and the, and the person who wrote the comment said something like, I like the way um, the professor uh, does not use ra racism to threaten people. Um, and I didn't really know how to interpret that. So how do you interpret that? Um, I interpret that as, um, it's like when I'm teaching my class mm -hmm. and I say, the issue is not white people. The mm -hmm. issue is white supremacy. Mm -hmm. If we understand that we've got a coda that is operating, that is corrosive, that is doing damage, we can make the choice not to participate in that operational piece that is, is eroding democracy, is eroding our self-worth. Mm -hmm. And so that's, I, that's how I take that, that this is about, we have the power to envision a humane world. Mm -hmm. We have the power not only to envision it, but to enact it. We have to take that power. We have to seize that power. And we have to, to wield it in order to get there. Yeah. yeah. And do you see, and this and I want this question, then we're going to move on to your latest book. But this question, do you see white rage being equally as dangerous to white people as it is to black people? White rage is lethal. And uh, one of the things that I laid out in the book, for instance, is that the, the white rage that came after Brown mm -hmm. that undercut access to quality education for all mm -hmm. has done enormous damage to the United States. So that as the US moved from a 
a, a manufacturing-based economy to a knowledge-based economy, when you have wide swaths of your population that have not had access to the education that they need in order to do this knowledge-based work, the entire economy is, 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 is quaking. Um, that we see it in, in terms of the war on drugs, which is the war basically on black people. As I said, black folks do drugs the least, mm -hmm. and except for marijuana where it's equal. The US has spent a trillion dollars on the war on drugs to lock up most those who do drugs the least. Mm -hmm. And you think about what that trillion could have meant in terms of infrastructure, in terms of making uh, high colleges affordable for all, in terms of access to quality healthcare. You can do a lot with a trillion dollars <laughs> besides locking up folks most who do drugs the least. Yes. yes. So let's, let's um, shift gears for a second um, to talk about your latest book, The Second, yes. Race and Guns in a Fatally Unequal America. Mm -hmm. uh, that title is very, very <laughs> telling to me. Um, but what encouraged you to explore the intersection of fractured citizenship and gun rights? It was the killing of Philando Castile. Uh, it was the black man in uh, Minnesota where the police had pulled him over and asked to see his ID. Castile, following NRA guidelines, alerted the officer that he had a license to carry concealed weapon but he was reaching for his ID as the police officer had asked. The police officer immediately began shooting. Mm -hmm. put, I think five bullets into mm -hmm. Philando Castile. Mm -hmm. And again, let's be clear, Castile wasn't brandishing the weapon. He wasn't threatening the police officer. He merely alerted the police officer that he had a gun. So he was killed for mere possession of a, of a legal licensed weapon. Mm -hmm. And the NRA went basically silent, basically silent. Um, after being pushed by African-American members in the NRA, they came out with a statement that, well, we believe that everyone should have the right to bear arms, regardless of race, uh, sexual orientation, religion. Yeah. And, it, and again, this is the same NRA that went after, after Ruby Ridge and after mm -hmm. Waco, mm -hmm. you know, called federal officers, jack booted government thugs. Um, so this is an NRA that has no problem in calling folk out. But when a black man is killed for merely having a weapon, virtual silence. And pundits were asking, well, don't black people have second amendment rights? And I thought, ooh, <laughs> that is a really good question. Because mm -hmm. uh, you know, in my first book, I dealt with human rights. The second one, decolonization and human rights, and then white rage, and then voting rights. But I hadn't looked at these Second Amendment rights. Mm -hmm. And so that's what, I, that's what got me on this pathway for this last book. Right. So this question um, sort of brings the, the, um, your motivation for, for looking at the Second Amendment and gun violence to bear on, um, let me just read it because it's kind of long. Let's explore the cultural ethos and intersections between the meaning of a well-regulated militia, fighting domestic tyranny and the policing of black people. On one hand, whites with guns are seen as patriotic and even deputized, but there's an anti-blackness toward black communities owning guns. Help us dissect the layers of what has happened in the past, starting with Thomas Jefferson, calling slavery a moral depravity on one hand, but maintaining the system while out of fear by stating, I fear that God is just. How do we see this framework shaking, taking shape today, if at all? Absolutely. And, and so with this book, I actually start in the 1600s mm -hmm. um, and, and look at the evolution of slave codes as the, sh showing the fear that the white community has against the enslaved, that they're gonna rise up, that they're gonna kill us, that there will be retribution for what we are doing to them. And so you see these laws early, early on, talking about uh, the enslaved shall not have access to weapons. They shall not be able to bear arms. They shall not have guns. 
Um, you see this consistently over and over and over, even doing having those kinds of laws for free blacks. Mm -hmm. And and this fear, what I lay out in the second is that during the constitutional ratification conventions where James Madison had put control of this well-regulated militia under federal control in the constitution, in the draft constitution, when there were the ratification conventions, when he gets to Virginia, Patrick Henry and George Mason are absolutely defiant. <laughs> they are like, oh no, you will not have that militia under federal control. We mm. cannot trust those folks from uh, Massachusetts and Pennsylvania to send in the militia when the slaves rise up against us. We will be left defenseless and we need to have that protection. And so basically they were willing to play the same kind of hardball game that they played in the, in the drafting of the constitution mm -hmm. itself to mm -hmm. say, we will undermine this constitution and have a new constitutional convention unless we get a bill of rights that protects us. And the second amendment is that protection. And so you see this over and over. So you get then, um, the, the 1792 Uniform Militia Act mm -hmm. that says that um, white men, all white men between the ages of 18 and 45 must join the militia and must own a gun. So you, you see in federal law, one of the first acts of Congress is to identify the militia as white and gun owning as the protection of American society. And, and coming out of that, you also have the Haitian Revolution, which scares, and I'm gonna use the scholarly term, bejeebers mm -hmm. <laughs> out of the founding fathers. Um, you, you see their letters to each other and they're talking about how the enslaved in Haiti are just slaughtering their masters, how mm -hmm. they are, you know, they've got these crazy ideas that they can be free, that they, mm -hmm. That, that the, the words of the revolution of equality and liberty and democracy apply to black people. That is the wrong idea in the wrong hands. Mm -hmm. um, and we've got to stop this. I mean, Thomas Jefferson is like, this is an evil that is coming upon us. We've got to stop it. And you mm -hmm. see this consistently coming through from, from that early period um, into the Dred Scott decision where, in 1857, where uh, uh, Chief Justice Roger Taney says, no, black people are not citizens. They weren't citizens at the founding. If they were citizens, they'd be able to cross state lines easily and they would be able to carry weapons whenever and wherever they wanted to. Mm. A, a black man has no rights that a white man is bound to respect. Yeah. Then after the Civil War, we get the Black Codes that have disarmament in there. We mm -hmm. must disarm Black people. And then you, you keep going. You keep going till we get to the Mulford Act in 1967 that is about stripping the Black Panthers of their ability to police the police. Mm -hmm. And then you get the 1968 Gun Control Act, which one of its critics had called the Negro Control Act. Um, and so this fear of black people. So even the stand your ground laws that are in place right now, mm. when you look at these stand your ground laws, what they say is that it expands the castle doctrine. The castle doctrine says that when you're in your house and somebody comes into your house on, who's unwanted, you have mm -hmm. the right to defend yourself. The stand your ground says wherever you have a right to be, and if you perceive a threat, you have the right to use lethal force. Well, when black is the default threat in American society, that perception of threat basically puts black people in the crosshairs. Mm. So this is why um, in stand your ground, uh, whites who kill black people under stand your ground are 10 times more likely to walk under justifiable homicide mm. than blacks who kill whites. I was smiling because uh, you made me <laughs> remember something. We had this 
running joke when I was in graduate school. Um, there were there was a cohort of us who studied together, worked together, and sometimes we would question certain things. And one of the people in the group would always say, "You guys need to remember now the the rules were made for us, not them." And that was a running joke with our group. But as you were sort of listing and you know um, explaining all of those rules, policies, things that have evolved, that's kind of the flashback moment that I was having. Right. You know, right. And so to think of the the Second Amendment, it was crafted as a means to control Black people. Mm -hmm. uh, that well regulated militia was the well regulated militia that Patrick Henry and George Mason, who were mm -hmm. who were had had hundreds of enslaved people, um, that that was what they demanded in mm -hmm. order to not scuttle the United sure. States of America. Sure. So um, in another Guardian article that you wrote, um, it was focusing on the pandemics of mass shooting and anti-Blackness, right? Um, but it's been a message where the NRA is loud about gun control and Black, Indigenous, people of color communities in those communities, but they were silent about mass shootings. The McCloskey couple who waved their guns at the Black Lives Matter, protesters passing by, Kyle Rittenhouse, and citizens invading the Capitol. This is where the NRA tends to go silent. Why hasn't this been called out in national conversations? And how do we find common ground, if any, to ensure equal protections at the same time curb militarized extremism from individual citizens and within the police forces. Mm. This is where, again, we mobilize, we organize, we keep having the conversations, we keep saying what we're seeing and we keep being really vocal about it. Um, this is where we do the heavy lifting where we know what those narratives are, the, mm -hmm. the histories of them, so that we make these connections. And so in that, then that guardian um, op-ed, one mm -hmm. of the things I was saying was that we have this, this, this pandemic of mass shootings and this pandemic of anti-blackness and, and, and the anti-blackness in America is preventing us from having real gun safety laws because you get this, this, this thing of the fear of black people keeps short circuiting the conversation mm -hmm. about uh, gun safety. So you get, we will be left defenseless. They will take our guns and we will be left defenseless. And so I think of this book by Jonathan Metzl called Dying of Whiteness, yes. where, yes, where he talks about being in Missouri um, with um, whites who have had gun violence in their family. And so he's in a kind of self-help group and they start talking about gun safety laws. And, and, and this group says, absolutely not. You will not take my gun because those folks from St. Louis will come down here and take everything that we have. Mm. So those folks from St. Louis becomes dog whistle language for black folk in St. Louis will come and take everything that whites in this community have if they don't have their guns to protect themselves. We've had some um, activity in the Q&A um, and I do want to get to, we're just about out of time, but I do want to get to a couple of these questions. Um, one in particular, um, and I'll just read it, Often policies discriminating and targeting black people are framed in other ways. War on drugs or voter suppression disguised as anti-fraud policy, thereby normalizing systemic racism and giving policymakers and their supporters an opportunity to prevent the, to pervert, prevent that the policies are not about race. How do we address this issue? And how do we make it clear that these policies are in fact about racial discrimination? Lord, that's what I've been trying to do. <laughs> um, and it is um, analyzing these policies, understanding the motivations behind them and making clear that we are looking at dog whistles, making clear that what we're looking at is the fig leaf that covers these discriminatory policies. One of the things that I lay out in White Rage in how to roll back the civil rights movement, mm -hmm. those, those gains from the civil rights movement, there have been several um, linguistic tricks 
um, that hide the, the, the ongoing efforts to undermine Black advancement. And it has been Lee Atwater, mm. who was uh, Reagan's uh, chief strategist in the Southern strategy. And he said, you know, in 1954, you could say the N-word. N-word, N-word, N-word. It didn't hurt you. Mm. By 68, you say it, it backfires. And mm -hmm. so you start getting really abstract and you start talking about these abstract things like taxes and states' rights and forced busing. And all of that is designed so that Blacks get hurt worse than whites. Yes. So, so uh, that I'm, strategy, then you know how to go after these policies and dissect them and then get the word out about what's really going on. Thank you. Um, Valerie, I'm going to call you out. She's one of your biggest fans here. And uh, Valerie Jones wants to know, does Professor Anderson think the U.S. will recover from the setback in the next 100 years? She says, I feel my children have a harder fight now than I had. Mm. This is why we're fighting right now. This is why we're fighting right now. Um, America is on the, the, the precipice. And we're getting ready to figure out what kind of nation we're going to be. Um, and, and, and you see one wave, the majority of the wave is moving towards a, a much more inclusive, multiracial, vibrant democracy. Mm -hmm. Then on the other hand, you have the move toward authoritarianism and, mm -hmm. a, and, a, and a tightly knit oligarchy that wants mm -hmm. to control all of these resources. Um, one of the things that I talked about in one person no vote in the updated edition was that what, what Hillary talked about in the 2016 election was this stronger together, that there were enough resources in the United States where we could all benefit. Mm -hmm. What Trump laid out was a neo-apartheid state so that you had this vast rightless labor pool where all of the resources that they were generating would come up to this small strata of whites, mm -hmm. but that they would depict this, that all whites would benefit from this, this system that they were putting in place. This is where we are right now. This is why the Voting Rights Act is so important. Um, those, those measures that are before Congress, the Freedom to Vote Act and the John Lewis Voting Rights uh, Advancement Act, that's why they are so important. Um, that's why I call your senator <laughs> um, and, and get them to understand what's at stake. Sure. Yeah. So there are some more questions and I've tried to read them, but I think what they all uh, focus on, and this can be your um, parting comments, uh -huh. give us something to be hopeful or a reason why we should continue. You've talked about it a bit, but for some of the people who raise these questions around um, white people deputizing themselves, um, the idea of dying of, of, of whiteness, how is that different from dying of blackness? So what is it that we really should be focusing on that would give us some hope? And, and to me where the hope is, is has been the consistent resistance to oppression, the consistent fight against oppression that has happened in this nation. Um, the consistent organizing, the consistent mobilization, the consistent theorizing about what freedom really looks like, what equality and equity really look like, and then working hard to implement that vision. What we can't do is give in to despair because the moment we give in to despair, it's over. It is over. It is in that fight where the hope is. Um, I think about, wow, I think about so much. I think about <laughs> the ways that um, the, the battle at Christiana, that's mm -hmm. a perfect way to, to end this. The mm -hmm. battle at Christiana happened in 1851 and it was in response to the Fugitive Slave Act of 1850 that mm -hmm. gave, um, plantation owners, the right to go anywhere to track down their enslaved people who had fled. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it required the North to, it, to be a full participant 
in this slave catching enterprise. And so this slave owner, Edward Gorsuch, comes up from Maryland into Pennsylvania. And he's got a US Marshal with him. He's got his son and he's got his nephew. And he goes to Christiana to get his property. <laughs> and the, the man who answers the door is a man named William Parker, who himself is a fugitive slave. Mm -hmm. But he's, he's like, what you want, old man? <laughs> he said, I come to get my property. And he said, you see that chair? It's not yours. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you see that bench? It's not yours. There's nothing in this house that belongs to you. Mm -hmm. And he said, I know my property's here and I'm going upstairs to get it. And Parker says, I'm gonna tell you what, old man, you may go up those stairs, but you're not coming down because mm -hmm. once you're up there, you're mine. <laughs> <laughs> And, and that kind of strength, yes. that strength is where the hope is in seeing the injustice and not tolerating it, not tolerating it. In fact, envisioning what freedom really looks like. And you think about it, this man who is talking smack, I mean, he is talking full blown smack to a slave owner. And I'm going to tell you what, old man, you come up those stairs, you're mine. Yeah. 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 That yeah. is a good note to end on. Yeah. I want to thank you for spending time with us this afternoon. We actually could have gone on much longer, um, but we realized that um, this has been uh, very, very enlightening. And I would encourage the uh, folk listening in, if you haven't read the books, White Rage, um, Professor Anderson's most recent book, The Second, I encourage you to get them and read them. I think you'll be um, enlightened by a lot. And perhaps uh, at some point um, as we journey on, we'll cross paths again, and perhaps we will see you in person eventually. That would be great. Uh, yeah, <laughs> but take good care and stay safe. Thank you, you too. All, Thank all you right, so good night. Good night. Good night.